Welcome to Science vs. Cinema. I'm Andy Howell. I'm an astronomer, but I'm also a film critic and a science advisor for books and movies. On Science vs. Cinema, we cover the science in movies. The goal isn't to just criticize films for doing the impossible. That's the fun stuff in science fiction. Instead, we examine real-world parallels and discuss whether the films approach the subject in a plausible way. In our previous episode on Dune, we covered Arrakis, Ornithopters, Still Suits, Spice, and Sandworms. But Dune Part 2 has revealed a little bit more about the universe, and that lets me comment on a few things we didn't get to before. Like the sand walk, a double eclipse, shields, levitation, riding sandworms, and extracting drugs from animals. There are real-world parallels for all these things, and the stories behind them are amazing. We're about to enter worm territory. We can't walk like regular humans. If we do, we're dead. When they're in areas with sandworms, the characters in Dune walk with a certain mannered gait, almost like a dance. That's because if they walk normally, the regular beat of their footsteps will attract sandworms. But if they change the pattern of their footsteps, it doesn't make a regular beat, like a drum, so the sandworms don't notice. The key concept to understanding this is something called a resonant frequency. We're all familiar with this, even if you don't know the physics. When you were a kid, you learned that if you pump your legs back and forth on a swing, you could go higher and higher. For that to work, you have to match the natural frequency of the swing. In other words, you have to be in resonance with it. If you kick randomly, you won't go anywhere, but if you kick your legs at just the right time, you can make the swing go farther. Believe it or not, spilling your coffee has a lot in common with getting eaten by a sandworm. The cup of coffee has a natural sloshing frequency, and if your steps match that, that's one reason it's so easy to spill. If I don't want my coffee to spill, I can just walk like they do the sand walk in Dune. If you vary the pace, you're varying the frequency, so your coffee won't slosh around and you won't attract any sandworms. Scientists from my own university, the University of California, Santa Barbara, have studied this. They concluded that you should walk slowly, watch the cup, not your feet, and accelerate gradually. There are some beautiful shots of the sun being eclipsed simultaneously by two moons. The largest is named Krellin, but usually it's called the first moon by the Fremen. The second moon is called Muad'Dib, which means kangaroo mouse in the Fremen language. I am Paul Muad'Dib Atreides! It's also the name that Paul Atreides chooses for himself among the Fremen, inspired by the large-eared mice we see in the desert. But can you really get a simultaneous eclipse by two moons? Yes! Look at this image from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, a NASA mission observing the sun. It shows the Earth eclipsing the sun, followed by the moon, as seen by a spacecraft near Earth. Now, if we want to examine a planet that has two moons, like Arrakis, we only have to look at one of our closest neighbors, Mars. It has two moons, Phobos and Deimos, both of which are much smaller than Earth's moon and won't totally block out the sun. Phobos is only 17 miles across at its widest point. Deimos is only at most nine miles across. They aren't even big enough for gravity to have crushed them into a sphere. NASA's Mars rovers like Spirit, Opportunity, and Perseverance have seen eclipses of the sun by both Phobos and Deimos, although we haven't caught them both doing it at the same time like we see in Dune. It is possible though, so if we keep looking long enough, maybe we'll catch it. Dune got it right. You can have a simultaneous double eclipse. <gasps> The slow blade penetrates the shield. In the Dune universe, many people have personal energy shields. They stop things like bullets, but you can penetrate them with swords and daggers. They say the shields have to be tuned to filter out projectiles at high velocity, but this lets in projectiles at lower velocities. From a narrative perspective, this is just a way to get some good old-fashioned sword fighting into a novel set in a high-tech universe. But are there real-world cases where a knife could get through defenses where a bullet couldn't? In fact, some bulletproof vests can stop bullets, but not knives. Bulletproof vests generally catch bullets in a web of many plies of woven material. But a knife can either cut those fibers or a spike can slip through the gaps. Some bulletproof vests are also resistant to stabbing, but they have to be specifically made for that. In the Dune lore, the shields are made possible because of the Holtzman effect, a kind of catch-all discovery that's said to be responsible for so many of the fantastical things in that universe, from shields to space travel. 
I like Newton creating a fictional physics discovery to cover some of the more fantastical elements of the storytelling. My desert. Levitation is also possible in the Dune universe through devices called suspensors. This is how Baron Harkonnen can float. Soldiers also use them to descend slowly from their ships or hop up mountainsides. Can we make anything that can counteract gravity in the real world? The best way to levitate something is using superconductivity. When certain materials are cooled down to near absolute zero temperature, they enter a superconducting state. That means they have perfect conductivity with no electrical resistance and they expel magnetic fields. That allows them to float above a magnetic field. Some maglev trains use superconductors to hover above their tracks, allowing them to reach top speeds of more than 300 miles per hour. Even still, this technology is demanding and limited. You need lots of energy, big magnets, and low temperatures. You can't get these kinds of effects that we see in Dune, but here again, we've got the Holtzman effect to the rescue. All my visions lead to horror. <laughs> they extract blue liquid from a young sandworm, which they call the water of life. That's a weird name because if you drink it, it usually kills you. But if you survive it, you can get superpowers to remember things from the past and see the future. We do have psychoactive substances on Earth that certainly give you the feeling that you have greater insight into the workings of the universe. They're mostly from fungi. In fact, one thing that helps differentiate magic mushrooms from normal boring mushrooms is that when you break them, they turn blue. So blue is a great color for the water of life. A lot of sea creatures are psychoactive when eaten, including clownfish, damselfish, rabbitfish, sea bream, sea chub, surgeonfish, goatfish, mullet, coral grouper, and pufferfish. If you eat any of those, you might have what some people call a fishing trip. Some frogs, toads, and red harvester ants can also make you hallucinate. Usually it's the venom in these creatures that's the fun stuff. In large doses it might kill you, but at a low dose the secrets of the universe might be revealed to you. But while psychoactive mushrooms can have a therapeutic effect, psychoactive animals are generally much more dangerous and not as much fun. Or so I've heard. There are also creatures with blue blood that humans find useful. Horseshoe crabs and their ancestors have been around for hundreds of millions of years. They were around when the dinosaurs were here. Our blood has hemoglobin, which is what allows our blood cells to carry oxygen and makes it red. Instead, the blood of horseshoe crabs has hemocyanin to serve the same role, which contains two copper atoms. That makes their blood blue. Their blood clots easily in the presence of bacteria, which makes it useful in testing pharmaceuticals and vaccines. So humans harvest horseshoe crabs and take some of their blood before releasing them again. That may seem kind of cruel, but it saved millions of human lives. One of the most dramatic scenes in Dune 2 involves riding sandworms. The Fremen have developed this technique where they put hooks into the scales of sandworms, allowing them to steer them as they cruise through the desert. The closest parallel on Earth is riding horses. About 6,000 years ago, the people of the Western Eurasian steppes first domesticated horses. That's long enough ago that we don't know exactly how it happened, but the results would have a profound impact on human development. Humans were able to travel much farther than ever before, resulting in better trading opportunities, easy settlement in new places, and the faster diffusion of knowledge and culture. But the sandworms aren't domesticated. There's not a great parallel for humans just opportunistically riding an animal, but there are a few cases of animals hitching a ride on other animals. One of my favorites is this picture of a weasel riding a woodpecker. How did somebody even get this picture? Is this like a common thing in the weasel community? I have to think that's an accident. But there are lots of other examples too, like a monkey riding a deer, a goat riding a sheep, and even a monkey on a parrot. Believe it or not, dolphins do something called whale riding. You might have seen dolphins swimming and jumping in the wake of a boat. Riding that wave kind of pushes them along and helps them swim with less energy, similar to cars and bicycle riders in races saving energy by drafting. Dolphins use this trick with whales too. They swim in the whale's wake and sometimes even get up close to their head so that when the whale breaches, the dolphin is launched into the air. He who can destroy a thing has the real control of it. 
Paul Atreides taps into his family's personal stash of nuclear weapons that they've hidden away in a cave in the desert. I don't know how long those nukes have been around, but it's actually pretty hard to maintain a stockpile of nuclear weapons and keep them viable for decades. The United States hasn't developed a new nuclear weapon since 1992, but they actually have an army of engineers and scientists at the US National Laboratories that manage the stockpile. This requires replacing worn out parts, changing the nuclear fuel every now and then, and modeling the weapons on supercomputers. You also have to keep training the next generation on how the nuclear weapons work because the people that built them in the first place might not be around anymore. At some point when the Atreides family went to Arrakis, presumably they brought their nuclear weapons with them. Transporting nuclear weapons is really dangerous. Since the 50s, there have been more than 30 accidents involving the transportation of nuclear weapons. Most of these are plane crashes, and in some cases, the conventional explosive and the warheads went off, sometimes leaving a huge crater. But fortunately, they either didn't have nuclear fuel in there or they weren't armed, so we've potentially avoided disasters so many times, and there's lots of evidence that we really just got lucky. It's kind of sad that in this fantastical future Dune universe, people still have nuclear weapons and are using them against each other. May thy knife chip and shatter. Dune Part 2 is a beautiful movie, but it has to get you invested in the politics of this made-up universe. If it goes too weird, you just won't care because you'll constantly be reminded that this is all just fantasy. But if it isn't fantastical enough, you'll just be bored. Dune Part 2 manages to walk this tightrope perfectly. There are exotic things like blue animal extracts that give you superpowers, shields, levitation, sandworms, and double eclipses, but they're based just enough in the real world that they seem plausible. At the same time, these differences from our world provide a rich culture, including mannered walks, animal riding, and sword fights that mirror things in our world, but with a twist. The Dune novels are legendary for their world building. I'm happy to see that Denis Villeneuve has translated them to the screen so beautifully and believably. There's a reason it takes like eight years to get a doctorate in linguistics. It's actually like really complicated. I had to talk with the physicists. I'm like, okay, great. Okay, I see why that makes sense. Why should anyone give a flying <laughs> I don't think you'll be able to use this. This is too physics geeky. Yeah, that's the thing. I've spent zero time in my life as a linguist thinking about. How do you talk to an alien? I guess the right answer is carefully.